and we are excited to be here for this hour with you. And when I say we, I mean Luke and I. Luke, it's a, it's a Wednesday. It's great to have you back. Uh, did you fill out your brackets yet for the Invest Talk Market Madness? I was just about to say we're coming up on the deadline for filling up your bracket, and I hope all of our listeners have been doing it. I know I'm excited for it. Did you fill yours out, though? Are you waiting oh, for the last minute? Oh, I've not filled mine out completely yet. I'm going to wait okay. to the last minute. Yeah, I guess you could say that. I like to give you stress. Yeah. Well, I've already filled mine out. And then after I did it and submitted it, obviously I'm not, it's just more of, obviously I'm not going to win, but I, I want to see how I do, right? It's, it's We fun. can't win? No, I'm kidding. I know we can't win. <laughs> we can't win. But hey, what if we come out on top of everyone else? I think that would be interesting. Um, but it's also probably maybe waiting till Friday might be better. I don't know. A little Friday see. night, Friday night bracket fill out action sounds nice. Yes, because then there's no more market action or news to kind of uh, ponder, etc. But you know that remind that is the the perfect note to remind all of you to fill out your bracket. You can win a thousand dollars. That's the grand prize. It is free to play. So head over to investtalk.com, fill out your brackets, download them, and complete your submission with the link provided. The deadline is this Sunday, March seventeenth. Now, we're going to talk about the market performance for today and run down some show topics. But as usual, Luke, we're going to talk to our first caller question now and take our first listener question. Hi, Justin. This is Glenn in San Francisco. I just wanted to check in with you about EQT. Bought it a few months back at 40. It shot up to close to 50. Now it's back to 38. And just wanted to see what you thought was driving this and whether this is a buying opportunity or just a hold. Thank you. All right, looking at EQT, this is a, it looks like an independent E&P company. And I think there was news on this recently, if I'm remembering correctly. Do you remember any news? Yeah, yeah, B of A adjusted their price. Oh, yeah, EQT, they're acquiring Equitrans Midstream in an all-stock deal. And I believe that's why the price of the stock fell uh, as of late. Uh so the question, this is, sounds pretty similar to, what was it? Well, uh, OKE, they bought uh, Enterprise Partners, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, the name. And so they're, they're doing something similar. And now EQT is typically more focused on oil and gas. So this is uh, a bit different of play. But when you buy a company using, when you buy a company using equity, markets tend to not like that quite as much because they're issuing equity, they're diluting shareholders, and it really has to pay off. And the cost of equity capital tends to be higher than most other types of capital, right? So I don't know. Do you think this is an opportunity to pick up shares on this drawdown? It certainly could be. You know, EQT is a a name we actually hold for clients. And uh, we bought it years ago, year ago, year ago or so. And so I think it's very well positioned uh, to do well as natural gas demand increases over the next couple of years. And it's at a price to book value about one right now. So like you said, I think the dynamics of what it looks like when you do an all stock, all stock purchase of a company, uh, the market tends to not like that. Uh, so once, once they get over that hump, should the acquisition go well, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't continue to uh, perform the way it has. And, uh, certainly its sales have, have been increasing over the years. They had a, they had a drop off in 2023, but so did the rest of the market. So I think it's still in a good position and maybe not just now, but certainly soon might be a good time to add some more. Yeah. And we tend to like the midstream assets and that's what they're buying. You know, uh, EQT is more of your typical independent natural gas producer. Uh, They focused on the Marcellus and Utica shale uh, regions in eastern United States. And that's an area that I think has been undervalued by the market in in general, uh, mainly because natural gas prices have been uh, relatively low, even though they're still producing natural gas at very uh, profitable levels. So um, this definitely diversifies their business. And frankly, I, I, I rather them not do it with equity. I think they have the, the balance sheet to do it, uh, w- with maybe a mix of equity and, and, and maybe debt and cash. Uh, but I like the, the acquisition of midstream to diversify their business and midstream assets tend to be more consistent and stable over time. Thanks for the call. 
No, we have a lot of ground to cover over the next 45 minutes or so. And our main focus point is about tax efficiency in your portfolio, how to think about making your taxable account more tax efficient. And a lot of people per, stop, a lot of people go into buying equities, making investments in a taxable account without any thought of the tax implications. And then they get into a situation where they don't want to make trades. And they're, they're stuck because they don't want to take the gains. But many times that's cutting off your nose to spite your face. So we're going to dig into that topic and discuss how to think about you, the tax efficiency in a taxable brokerage account. In addition, we have some other topics. One is in regards to gold. Gold prices are at an all-time high. And the question is, what is driving this? And we're going to talk about a few of the tailwinds behind that move. Also, minerals. The demand for various types of minerals are headed higher, especially battery metal, mineral, metals, as well as steel, copper, aluminum, etc. Things that go into the green energy revolution, EV revolution, etc. And there has not been a lot of investment in new supply. And today's copper move was a maybe an example of that so we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail and then lastly brexit how the brexit change has made it harder to trade and invest in the united kingdom so those are things that are on our mind we're also going to get to your voice bank questions one is in regards to leg legget and platt as well as Amdocs, D-O-X. And of course, most importantly, your finance and investment questions are top of mind. At end, And you can give us a call now at 888-99-CHART. Now we're going to a short break. On the other side, Luke and I will talk about today's market activity. But please remember, you can call anytime and leave your question on the Invest Talk Voice Bank. And if you're listening via our live stream on AM 1220 Radio in the Silicon Valley area, or on our website, investtalk.com, you can call now at 888-99-CHART. Invest Talk callers make each podcast unique. I was pulling about Intel, if it's worth holding on to, or should I sell it? Their questions are curious. Hello, I had saved up around $80,000, and I was wondering what I should do to make it grow. Careful. Oh, I'm just wondering, is this a value trap? Because it looks like it's gone down quite a bit. Concerned. Uh, it's taken quite the tumble today. I've been trying to get out of this position for a while. I think I waited too long. And clever. Does seem to be situated in some areas of expanding population. And Justin Klein, Steve Peasley, and now Luke Guerrero are always ready with their unbiased answers. And this is, uh, looks like a classic example of chasing yield. Don't chase the yield. Next 12 months price to earnings is around 30. I just don't see it at this price. Don't forget to call Invest Talk 888-99 chart. Invest Talk is here to help. And when you download the free Invest Talk podcasts, don't forget to rate and review. The phone lines are open 888-99 chart. Now, Luke, let's take a quick look at the markets today. What did uh, the major indices do in the equity side? Yeah, the S&P 500 was down slightly, though off of worse levels, down about 19 basis points. The Russell 2000 was up about 30 basis points. And the equal weight index was pretty flat. So overall, better day for small caps than it was for large caps. I think from a narrative perspective, there wasn't really much going on today. It was kind of a day without any news. Tomorrow, there's... I believe initial claims is tomorrow. Retail sales are tomorrow. So certainly on top of the slightly hotter than expected CPI da uh, data that came in yesterday, it'll be interesting to see how the consumer reacted in the last month in terms of uh, retail sales. Well, I think most important tomorrow is the PC, uh, the, the producer price index. and how, Oh, yeah, that as well. Yeah, because and I, said, I talked about this uh, yesterday. I think it was yesterday's show about how everyone focuses on the CPI, but the PPI is is a leading indicator of where the, the CPI is actually going. So uh, that, I think, is a more important number to uh, to look at. And we'll get that tomorrow. And then after that, you pretty much have the Fed meeting, 
you have import export prices on Friday, so that'll be important too. But then the Fed meeting next week, and I think the market will start looking at that or paying attention to it. Uh, it was, like you said, a, a mixed bag overall, but still uh, the value side did much better. Uh, if you're looking at the Morningstar website, both all small, mid, and large cap value were up on the day, anywhere from about 20 basis points to 30 basis points. And the worst part of the market, large cap growth down 54 basis points. And there were some big movers there. Dollar Tree, that was down 14%. They're, they're, they're closing about 1,000 stores. Uh, United Steel was down 12%. You also had some uh, bigger tech names. You had AMD down 4%, Tesla down 4.5%. Tesla is quietly edging towards a 52-week low. It's back to levels not seen since May of last year. And its high was back in July when you know the market kind of peaked out. I was almost $300 per share. Now we're at 169. So Tesla is quietly down o- o- almost 50% and it looks very sickly. So uh, Nvidia was also down 1% today. Apple down 1%. Marathon Digital down 2.4. Some of the big gainers, look, we had a good day. William Sonoma up 17 quarters percent. It's a name we've owned for a, a-, a while as well as Southern Copper. Copper, uh, exploded higher on news that China was shutting down some of their copper smelters. Uh, and it's another example of how f- so many people focus on demand, and demand is certainly important. But supply, especially when it comes to commodities, is equally important. And so when suddenly supply comes offline, major supply like ch- the Chinese smelters, uh, that's going to really put, put a move in uh, that underlying commodity price and that's what happened with copper today so those are the big movers gold was up as well uh overall i still see that rotation uh where when the dollar weakens and economic growth and inflation numbers are turning a bit higher that is a recipe for money to flow into what are what i I call more cyclical parts of the market as opposed to secular growth names so when cyclical growth is getting better then money flows into the cyclical names. When it's getting worse, the market tends to go and search for growth somewhere, and they tend to move more towards the, the, the secular growers. And so that's the shift you're seeing right now. And if the dollar continues to weaken and the economic numbers stay fine, right? you don't have big deflationary impulse, then uh, that's going to mean more money flowing into uh, equities or cyclical equities. And I don't know if you saw Luke, but Goldman Sachs just upgraded their earnings expectations for S&P earnings for 2024. So a lot of factors impacting the markets today, mainly that weak dollar. And we'll see about the PC, the CPI, no, PPI, PC, PPI tomorrow. There we go, PPI. PPI. Now let's pivot back to the Invest Talk Voice Bank. You know the number, it's 888 chart Hi, this is Adrian Klein from Texas, and I wanted your thoughts on ticker symbol D-O-X. Looking pretty good. I'll pick this up on Fidelity, holding it for a short to midterm hold. What's your thoughts on it? Thank you. All right. This is Amdocs. Amdocs, about $11 billion market cap. It is certainly a slow grower. Revenue growth last quarter was 5%. Earnings growth, 8%. Earnings are supposed to fall 5% this year, but back up 14% next year. 2% dividend yield and what they do is they provide software and services to communication cable and satellite entertainment and media industry service providers uh you know it's the market's doing well and this is doing well they don't have much debt on their balance sheet that's a positive that i see here do you think it's cheap enough considering how slow of a grower it is well not only do they not have a lot of debt on their balance sheet there's a lot, they've also been consistently buying back shares over the past 5 years they're at 140 million shares outstanding now they're at 110 million and that sales growth from last year has been pretty consistent their 5 year annualized growth rate is around 4.2%. I don't hate the company. Certainly don't hate the company. I think that the dividend yield seems to be justified. It's something that seems to be pretty consistent. I uh yeah, I've I've nothing wrong with this. Yeah, solid name 15 and a half percent return on equity. I'd give this thumbs up that not, not going to blow the socks off anything but uh, a very quality business and a good capital allocator now we're heading into a break give us a call at 888 chart
Let's take a quick look at your financial to-do list. At the top, make that phone call to the Invest Talk Anytime listener line, 888-99-CHART. Now, the latest episode of Invest of the Invest Talk Classroom is posted and ready to watch now. And you can dive into the Bitcoin ETF story and its p- potential effects for the economy. It's where Luke and I provide a detailed analysis of what the future might hold in episode 17 entitled Bitcoin ETF Impact. Just search Invest Talk Classroom over on YouTube. Now, our focus point today is about tax efficient portfolios. And this is something many investors don't think about when they start investing in a taxable account. And they might do well, and then they hold on for dear life because they don't want to pay those taxes. They want to avoid them at all costs. And frankly, Luke, I've said this many times, avoiding taxes is one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is they are they, they, they don't want to pay Uncle Sam at all. And they put it off for as long as possible. And what typically happens is that they eventually see those profits reverse completely. And then they don't have any profits to take. They actually have losses. And then they then they don't want to sell either because now they're down. So how how do you think investors can kind of get over that mental hurdle of properly rebalancing their portfolio and taking reasonable tax hits that they're going to have to take eventually because there's a tax deferral, the tax deferred liability that's sitting there as well that they'll have to take eventually unless it goes to a loss, right? Yeah, that's true. And I think that one of the biggest thresholds is getting past the short term to the long term capital gain. People are very hesitant to take short-term capital gains. And I think generally you should avoid doing that unless there's some ridiculous run-up in a security where you think this is completely unreasonable and it's going to fall 50% tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly know some people who lost some money on SMCI at one point because they they didn't want to wait to, or they wanted to wait to long-term capital gains and it fell, it's recovered. But still, anecdotally, there are some times where that can be the case. You get a little worried. So I think generally speaking, it's okay to wait till long-term unless you think there's going to be a huge correction or you, there's a reason for a huge correction. But I think another problem people face is not understanding the tax implications of their investments generally. So it's less of a problem now with a lot of people investing in broader ETFs that are far more tax efficient than mutual funds. But some but mutual funds have to distribute capital gains and dividends. And so they distribute it to all investors, whereas ETFs are just going to be generally to the investors that are redeeming, right? So when people are owning mutual funds, it, they own funds that have a lot of turnover. And so if you have a lot of turnover, you have a lot of potential for capital gains. That's going to be passed along on to you. So I think the first step in, t- in tax efficiency is understanding the the core efficiency of what you're owning. Yeah, that, that goes back to what we always say is, is know what you own, know the upside as well as the downside. And taxes are a potential downside. And the way that we handle it for clients uh, and to try to get them out of this destructive psyche of never taking gains and avoiding them at all at all uh, costs is, is basically saying you, what you're doing is exponentially uh, increasing the risk in your portfolio. And I always use BlackBerry as a good example. BlackBerry was up dramatically. The early 2000s, everybody and their mother, it was the business cell phone of choice because you could email very easily. Uh, It was the king before the iPhone. And so many people had huge gains on that stock. And then suddenly they were out innovative, out out innovated, and things changed and and their stock fell 95 plus percent. And all those people that are worried about capital gains, they they were losing money now. And so it would have been much better if those portfolios rebalanced and got their position into a more reasonable size. And you can go out through history. Obviously, high flyers can turn into big duds, you know, from Enron uh, to Cisco to all over the board, right? And so what's to say the current tech high flyers, Google is a good example. We've talked lately about how there's a potential risk of AI really encroaching on 
their search business. And that could potentially impale them. But there's a lot of people out there that probably have owned Google for a decade plus, And they're not selling it because they don't want to pay the tax. When either it's, it's going to uh, not live up to the hype and eventually, you know, go back down dramatically, or maybe it stays up, but you're going to have to pay the tax man eventually anyway, because you're going to want to use that money, probably, unless you're just going to hold it until you die, you get stepped up basis to your kids. That's probably the only argument against doing smart rebalancing on positions that are overweight and have huge capital gains. Can you think of any other reason why you might not trim some of those positions? No, I mean, generally I don't. I think that, like you said, people tend to be very averse to giving up some of their money to the tax man, but the tax man always gets his money. Um, And in doing that, they tend to or can prevent themselves from realizing some, if any, profit from from holding those positions. So like I said, there are reasons why to delay selling, right? If you're talking about the difference between a high tax rate and, and a long-term capital gains tax rate, I get it. You want to wait a couple weeks? Makes perfect sense. But again, you just have to do it in a reasonable way and not trick yourself out of realizing the profit that you've made in your portfolio. And most people think of this all or none, like, hey, I need to sell, sell it or, or not. No. Well, what about trimming consistently throughout time? and getting that down to a reasonable number. And that's usually the best course of action. Now, the next Invest Talk, we'll look into this topic, the 10 most important shareholder rights. That story tomorrow. But for now, I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero. We're ready to take your calls at 888-99-CHART. Let's say you've been thinking about learning a new language. Okay, why? I mean, how would it come in handy? And where would you want to use it? Could it be that you have an upcoming international trip? Or maybe you want to connect with family members or friends from a different culture. I think you should know about Rosetta Stone. With millions of users, it's been the world's most trusted language learning program for 30 years. Rosetta Stone is available on your desktop or as an app with audio companion and the ability to download lessons offline. Rosetta Stone truly immerses you in the language you want to learn. It has a built-in, patented speech recognition engine called True Accent. So as you practice speaking, you'll get feedback on how well you pronounce words. With Rosetta Stone, you pick up a language naturally. First with words, then phrases, then sentences. It's an intuitive process designed for long-term retention. You really learn to speak, listen, and think in your new language. Rosetta Stone is an amazing value. So your special skill set is within easy reach. You know you want to do this. So don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, InvestTalk listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. Visit rosettastone.com today. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off now at rosettastone.com slash today. Every investor is working to build a secure financial future. How they get there and when they get there, that depends on many variables. The more you learn about how the market works, the better your chances so don't forget to call Invest Talk 888-99 chart. Hello Justin and Luke, my name is uh, Brian. I'm calling from Ohio. I'm curious about the dividend safety score of Legged and Platt, LEG. I currently have a position. I'm down 38% trying to figure out if I need to cut my losses or hold out. Uh just need a little advice. See what you think on the score of the dividend. That's really the only reason why I hold it. Thank you. All right. Looking at Leggett and Platt, LEG is the symbol. And Luke, its current yield is 9.5%. Now, what is your first instinct when you hear that a company has a current dividend yield of 9.5%? It's not going to be 9.5% for long. 
there you go. That's my first <laughs> my first inclination. And it's pretty clear by the earnings trends that this is headed for a dividend cut, uh, as well as the, the chart, right? He talked about him being down. This is at a 52-week low. And the lowest, let me zoom back out to a monthly chart here. Yeah, it hasn't been this low since 2012, 2012. And revenue growth last quarter was down 7% year over year. Earnings are down 33% year over year. And it looks like they have about $2 billion in, de- in long-term debt on a $2.5 billion market cap. Times interest earned, Luke, negative one, negative one. So do you think they're going to cut the dividend this year? I, probably. I mean, it looks to me like they have to. Their cash flow has been increasing, interestingly, while their profitability has been steadily falling before dropping off a cliff a little bit at the end of last year. But one thing that also strikes me is that their quick ratio, which is essentially a, a comparison of their liquid assets to their liquid liabilities, has dropped below one for the first time in five years. So, I mean, the company's not in a good fundamental financial position. And even with that, it looks like investors would still be paying about a two in terms of a price to book. So so just looking at the fundamentals of the company, it's forward looking price to earnings of sixteen right now. It just doesn't seem even at this at these prices like it uh it's a good investment. So I would I would expect over the next year this dividend to be cut. Their dividend yield five year average is closer to four point six percent. So once again, this is just goes to show that you can't take a dividend yield at face value. Yeah, and, and anytime it's elevated like that, it's the market is signaling to you that that dividend is going to be cut. And their operating margins are to, down to the lowest levels since the financial crisis. That's how bad. And for everyone else out there, you, you would imagine it would be a good business. What they do is they make a lot of the cushions that go into bedding components, automotive seats, lumbar systems, uh, etc. So... They make specialty bedding foam, private label mattresses, et cetera. And, you know, is it because people are moving less because the housing market turnover is slower? Maybe that's that's why. Um, obviously, auto sales have been improving, but still not back to booming levels. So overall, just the backdrop of the economy, for them at least, is not looking so hot. So. Uh, I think Leg and, Pl- Leg and Platt is uh, headed for a dividend cut, and you should sell it, cut your losses, and move on. Thanks for the call. Now, Luke, let's touch a bit on the mining industry. And this is a good time to talk about this because of the big jump in copper prices today. Uh, but today's miners are, you would think, they would be investing to help with the green transition. Talk about battery metals, such as nickel, lithium, cobalt, and then you have other materials such as steel, copper, and aluminum. Those are all needed and in high demand for the energy transition. So you would think that companies would be trying to take advantage of that uh, and put investment into the ground to pull more out of the ground. But the simple answer is they're not. In fact, the world's largest miner, BHP, last year spent less than half on exploration and development than it did a decade ago. So how is this transition going to happen if we don't have the requisite materials that are needed to make that happen? You're right. We talked about maybe a couple months ago how... Uh, Dr. Copper, which used to be a harbinger for what was to come with the economy on a macro scale, is more uh, indicative of the demand of the green transition, right? So looking at copper prices, kind of you, you should change your perspective on what it's telling you. And that's because these minerals, like you said, are very important for the green transition. And so governments that are telling people this is it's critical that we secure these metals in order to help us uh, transition are really in practice – not authorizing enough of mine openings. And so these companies that are trying to invest in opening mines, which are already incredibly capital intensive, now have this regulatory hurdle, which they certainly don't seem to be able to overcome. So the core of the problem to me seems to be this mixed messaging with reality of how governments are operating. 
yeah, if you look at here in America, there's a backlog of almost 300 mining projects. And on average, a it, it takes 16 years to get a mine up and running. Think about it, 16 years. And the permits alone oftentimes take a decade. And then, then you have to actually go and start building the mine and, and, uh, and, and creating the infrastructure around it. And that's a big part of it too. It's not just building the mine, but many of these jurisdictions are saying, okay, now you also need to uh, build out this road and maybe uh, create this level of it, this, this infrastructure project uh, in parallel with it to support the long-term viability of that mine, et cetera. So that also increases the cost. So it's not just about the time it takes, the lead time, uh, and it's also the, the, the cost uh, that goes into, that continues to go up. And how is a business supposed to commit billions of dollars in capital to create this, this mine that they don't know what the profitability will be like when it opens, if it takes 16 years, who knows what the demand for that underlying uh, project will be. Um, so it, this varies definitely depending on what type of metal or material you're talking about. We've talked many times about how lithium, it's a lot easier to get out of the ground. It's, it's easy to find. It's typically on the surface. It's, you don't have to dig very deep. Whereas copper, that, that does take uh, a lot longer uh, to get those permitted and, and actually dug. So you definitely have to take into account which metal you're talking about. It's not a one size fits all uh, approach. And that's why there there's various uh, performance. There's a lot of, there's a lot of performance variability within the base material space, depending on what they are mining for. So uh, pretty interesting to see how this evolves, but it's pretty clear that commodity prices more generally are probably headed higher if the requisite supply can't come online. Now let's keep those questions coming. We love taking live calls and voice bank calls on 888 chart Hello, Talks. I'm calling today about Cord Energy, ticker symbol CHRD, and Conical Phillips, ticker symbol COP. Cord Energy recently finalized a merger with Enterplus, ticker symbol ERS, and I'd like your opinion on what that would mean for Enterplus shareholders. The company's fundamentals, growth, and debt levels all appear attractive. So I was thinking of adding Cord Energy in preparation for the merger because it appears to be on the cheaper side. Conical Phillips, on the other hand, is a much larger company, which I think is reasonably value based on the price of oil per barrel. And the shareholder, it appears to be a very shareholder friendly business. So I'm interested in taking a full position as well. Thank you, and I'll be listening on the podcast. Well, this hits right at home, Luke. We own. Enterplus, as well as ConocoPhillips, and Enterplus, as the caller said, just got bought out by Cord Energy. Uh, well, Cord is a much smaller name, about $8 billion, $7 billion market cap here, 3% dividend yield, whereas ConocoPhillips, much bigger, $138 billion, obviously much more diversified in their business. They operate in 13 different countries, whereas Cord is more of a domestic producer here in North Dakota and Montana. So to me, it's kind of like, what do you want? Do you want a big diversified player or do you want something that's smaller and more niche and then maybe made a good acquisition uh, of Enterplus, I think, uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to be the best performer longer term. What, what would you go with? Yeah, it's a difficult question because so it looks like Cord shareholders are gonna own two thirds of the combined company. Mm -hmm. With Enterplus holders, so Enterplus would get one third. Generally speaking, in mergers of relatively equals, if you will, mm -hmm. of this size, I would tend to stay away from them. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if you think they're discounted, you really don't know how the synergies between these companies are going to flesh out because you essentially have a, a, a known entity that's going to be created here, right? And so now the pricing scheme is, is or rather the market price is based upon the market's perception of each company, how it's going to fit together, right? So I wouldn't necessarily think it was it was undervalued. It's definitely the more risky play, not just because it's, like you said, a smaller name, but also because you don't know the outcome of that, uh, of that uh, merger. So for me, I would probably lean towards getting the exposure in the larger, broader name. 
Yeah, I, I would agree. And I talked about this, maybe you were on the show, Luke, uh, about a month or so ago, and it was it was about those mergers of equals. And they don't actually tend to do very well if the initial reaction is flat to down. They tend to only do well when the reaction in the market is positive. And the reaction in the market for Cord was mildly negative. Uh, it closed around 160 eight dollars uh pre-announcement and it closed the next day around 162 dollars it's not a big drop uh, and it's still kind of down from those levels at 164 uh today so you know i i i pro even though i like we like enter plus obviously we we owned it and now cord we're, we're selling it we're going to move uh, probably that capital uh elsewhere uh, away from cord uh we still own conical phillips we like the diversity there and they're good capital allocators so uh i would go with conical phillips over cord energy. Thanks for the call. Now, 2024 is humming along and the first quarter is nearly over. We only have a couple of trading weeks remaining before we get wow. into the second quarter. And of course, what's most important to you is capitalizing on your capital, deploying that most efficiently, effectively in the current market environment. At the top of the show, we talked about that shift in the market away from kind of those secular growth names into the more cyclical names in the economy. And so the question is, is your portfolio aligned with this new emerging trend that we're seeing? Well, if you need help understanding whether the risk in your portfolio is appropriate for your risk tolerance level, or just if you are aligned with the current market trends, I encourage you to reach out to myself or Luke at our company, KP Financial, where we practice parallel investing, which means we invest right alongside our clients. And of course, you can schedule a call by heading over to investtalk.com, click on the portfolio review button on the top right hand part of the screen. Now, this is Invest Talk, now with more than 58 million downloads, and our work continues in 30 seconds. So hang on. Every investor is working to build a secure financial future. Calling for your assessment of Blackstone Incorporated. Everyone's situation is different. Just wanted to get your opinion on JP Morgan. And so are their questions. Get your thoughts on CRM, Salesforce. Each podcast is unique and you set the agenda. I'm wondering if now. 24 7, rain or shine, Invest Talk is made better by the power of you. 888 99 chart. You know, Justin, we just talked a little bit about copper and input materials for the green transition. But I think something that caught a lot of people by surprise, maybe not necessarily us, I know we were pretty well allocated towards, towards gold miners, is the sneaky, quiet ascent over the past couple weeks of gold. And generally, people perceive gold to be a safe haven asset. Right, So you tend to see a rise in gold prices not necessarily happening alongside this optimism about the U.S. economy, though one could argue that gold tends to rise as interest rates tend to fall because people who are looking for uh, you know, the, the yield or rather for a safe haven tend to move out of the lower yielding treasuries into gold. But still, given the geopolitical risk outside of the United States and these dynamics of the economy, it seems to be a bit surprising. What are, you, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I think there are a couple of catalysts. Uh, we talked before about the demand out of the East from India, as well as uh, Russia and China. A lot of people are putting in China are putting money, their savings into gold as opposed to property now that their property market is not doing very well. Um, so that's uh, certainly a, a lot of demand. Central banks as well with what happened with us confiscating the treasuries of Russia when they invaded Ukraine. That was kind of a shot to say, hey, if we don't like your politics or what you're doing, we're going to confiscate your assets. So instead of putting them in their, their excess reserves in things like uh, like treasuries, they're putting it more and more in gold. So uh, that's kind of been this consistent buyer out there in the marketplace. And the recent catalysts, I think, have a lot to do with inflation expectations. Inflation expectations on the three and five year basis are starting to tick up, especially when you look at what's happened with uh, the inflation numbers of, of the, over the past couple of months. They've been a bit, a bit higher than market expectations, but it hasn't really shifted the Fed to a more hawkish stance. They're kind of staying at that three rate cut situation. So when inflation expectations rise and interest rate expectations for the next few years kind of stay the same, well, that means real yields 
go more negative. And so uh, that's certainly sparking has been sparking uh, gold prices a, a bit higher. Uh, you also have geopolitical situations. Obviously, what's happening with uh, Israel and Hamas, that's a, that's a big issue. Uh, and so there's just a lot of tailwinds here for gold prices. And what's most importantly is not a lot of people are talking about it. So that probably pretends to higher prices going forward. Now we're heading into our final break. So give us a call now at 888 chart In today's market, more than ever, you need unbiased investing guidance because it can help you achieve financial freedom. Well, you've come to the right place, Invest Talk. And Justin Klein is here now taking your calls live. So step up with your questions, 888 99Chart. Hello, Invest Talk. My name is uh, Brian. I'm calling from Ohio. It's, this is my first time calling in. I'd like to get your thoughts on Procter & Gamble. The ticker symbol is PG. I've owned it in my portfolio for a number of years. It's one of my core holdings. And I was wanting to know what you thought was a good value price on Procter & Gamble. Also wanting to know if you could tell me what kind of metrics that you use to figure out a good value price on a stock. Thanks a lot. Bye now. We're looking at Procter & Gamble. This is the bellwether of blue chip stocks, consumer staple stocks, non-cyclical type of uh, company. Although there's definitely some cyclicality to their business because they have branded products that tend to trade or sell for higher prices than their store bought counterpart uh, or store brand ca counterpart. And obviously the economy reaccelerating. I think that's why you're getting the stock kind of accelerating to near 52 week highs. Yeah. Uh, not all time highs quite yet. That's uh, closer to 165 or 162.30 at the close today. Uh, and after this run, Luke, it looks a little expensive trading at 20, but 23 times forward looking earnings. That's a bit stretched for my liking. Uh, I'll pay a bit of a premium for a company that has very strong return on invested capital. But am I going to pay this much? Do you think it's modestly overvalued? I'm not necessarily sure it's it's modestly overvalued. I mean, it's it's revenue growth over the past five years is an annualized 4.2%, but its price to sales is sitting at a 4.8, which is right in the middle of that range of its five-year average. Its price to book is at an eight, again, also in the middle of that average. I know that Procter & Gamble specifically uh, had some bloat, if you will, cut out of it uh, by activist investors back in 2022. I know one of Nelson Peltz's big complaints was the massive offices they had that were completely unnecessary. So they held a lot of things within that PP&E section of their of their uh, accounting that was was unnecessary for a company like it. So in terms of large companies such as this, I think Procter and Gamble benefits from having recently seen activist investors come in and and uh, streamline it. So that's certainly a benefit as well. Uh, but generally speaking, I mean, I like the company. Like you said, it's a, it's a bellwether for for the economy. If you believe the economy is going to do well, better than others going forward, then then certainly this is a good place to park your cash. And I don't I don't think that it's that it's too overvalued from a couple of metrics that I'm looking at. Yeah, it, it's and I think you, the reason for that is what you just said is the fact that they've trimmed uh, a lot of that PPE. And if you look at their operating cash flow in late 2022. The trailing 12 month was only 14.6 billion. That was down from its peak in early 2021 of 19 billion. So think about it. from 19 billion all the way down to 14 billion in change. Now we're back to all time highs over 19.21 billion in trailing 12 month operating cash flow. So uh, that those activist investors they did some nice work there to help bring profitability back higher. And if you look at uh, things like return on invested capital, we're at uh, 18% now, which is near uh, an all-time high. So I, I I like the business. I personally, based on things like enterprise value, but at 18 times, that's it's a bit high for a company that is a low growth, right? It's, it's not going to grow very fast. It tends to grow about the growth of the economy. Right, last quarter, revenues were up 3%. Earnings were up 16%. Earnings this year are supposed to be at 5% and 8% next year. But those estimates are coming down a bit. So, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily trim it. I would say it's 
near or slightly above value, but it's such a good business that it's probably going to continue to pay that 2.3% dividend and grind higher over time. So um, I would just hold it. Now, Luke, his other question was, what do you look at to understand whether this is over or undervalued? I just quoted enterprise value to EBITDA. What's your favorite? Yeah, price to book, price to earnings. Those are good ones to look at. But I think it also general, generally you got to compare it relative to what your what your growth picture looks like too. You're definitely going to be willing to pay pay more of a, a multiple for for large consistent growers than you would under growers. And profitability, right? Like the, how profitability. is that profitability and and uh, it's a mosaic. The, it's yeah, a mosaic. the sustainability of their of their business, the moat that they their business has, etc. Uh, the the stronger that is, the higher premium I'm willing. Hey, thanks for the call. Well, that about does it. I'm Justin Klein with Luke Guerrero, and we completed another Invest Talk program. We thank you for listening, and we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and be sure to rate and review on iTunes as well. And tell your friends about the Market Madness Contest. It's free to enter, and you and them can win the grand prize of $1,000. Just head over to investtalk.com. Independent thinking, shared success. The best talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. InvestTalk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461. Steve Peasley is president and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial.